Teresa Lynn Butler was a 35-year-old married mother of two from Risco, Missouri. She worked at Walmart and just recently learned to drive a manual transmission. On January 24, 2006, as was usually the case, her husband left to work the night shift while she remained at home with their two sons. The next morning, when he returned, the boys were there unharmed, but Teresa was gone. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. I have to admit something to all of you listeners. We're about five months into this program, Unfound, and I look at dozens of cases a day. I go to the charlieproject.org site and peruse what happened on a certain date and a certain year. Do that every day. If you follow me on Twitter, the show on Twitter, you know that. And still, I cannot decode why some cases are well-known and some aren't. I've really tried to study that. Is it the family? Is it where the person was from? Is it the way the person looks? Is it an attractive person, an unattractive person? So what is it? I can see out there families who are doing everything to try to get attention for the disappearance of a loved one, and you've heard some of those people on this show But it seems they run into brick walls everywhere. Whereas it seems in other cases where there are families who aren't doing much and still those disappearances get a lot of attention. Once again, it's hard to understand because for me, and as I've told you, and this is the reason I do this program, I think that media exposure helps in the solving of cases. I run across cases on a daily basis where I think, Why isn't this case better known? Granted, you know my attitude, and I've expressed it many times, that all of these cases should be well known, every single one of them. And I have to tell you that it's unfortunate that I can only do one of these programs a week, given all of the people who have disappeared over the years. But I look at a certain person who has disappeared, and I see that somebody has set up a website. There's a Facebook page. The victim seems to be fairly likable. There are mysterious circumstances. There are some seemingly some decent leads. There's a lot to talk about. And really it seems to me, just looking at it like I do on the internet, that some progress can be made if this case were to get some attention that all of these other cases that end up in everybody's top 10 do. And still, after a Facebook page, website, likable victim, all of these other qualities, this case isn't well known. I bring this all up because this program's case, the disappearance of Teresa Butler, is one of those. When I first ran across it sometime last year, I said, How is it I've never heard about Teresa Butler before? How is it that her case has never been covered on the ID channel, that it's never been on Disappeared? Why is that? It seems like it would be made for TV. A mother uh, with two children at home, she disappears, the children are still there, some things are stolen, this small little town of 300, 400 people in Missouri It's a compelling story. And still, it seems like nobody knows about it. And you're going to find out that there are multiple motives, maybe for her disappearance. There are some different persons of interest. I mean, she vanished out of her own house. And so here I am. I believe I'm going to be the first person to really cover this case in depth. And that's a little surprising to me. Having said that, 
upon covering this case and working on it for quite a while, actually, maybe I did find a reason. And it's a four-letter word, and it starts with an F, and no, it's not the word you think. It's the word fear. Would you believe that I contacted two reporters who covered this case back when it happened, back when Teresa uh, disappeared, and they wouldn't talk to me? I tried to contact the family of Teresa Butler, and they wouldn't talk to me, even though I know that they have done some interviews in the past. And I just want you to know, I don't necessarily take that personally, but it is a question mark in my mind. And even the woman that I have for the interview today, who is one of Teresa's best friends, she expressed some concern about coming forward. And as I started putting this all together, what I think I knew about that, this case, the word fear kept popping up. And you should know this, this friend of hers, she runs the Teresa Butler website, and she started the Facebook page. But I get this feeling that there is something lying underneath all of this in Risco, Missouri. And you're going to find out about that in this interview. That fear, it feels, is very, very real. This small town where still nobody seems to know what happened to a likable mother of two who seem to be perfectly happy and happily married. But the fear remains of not knowing what happened in a place where everybody knows everybody. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's site, charlieproject.org. But I should note for the record, and this is not Megan's fault, you're going to hear some information during the interview for this episode that contradict some of the facts in this summary. Teresa Butler is believed to have disappeared from her residence on County Road 241 near Risco, Missouri on January 24, 2006. She was last heard from when she spoke to a relative on the phone at 10 p.m. after Teresa's husband had already left for work. Her husband got home the next morning at 10 a.m. to their two sons' home alone. There were several items missing from within the house, but no signs of violence were seen. There were no signs of forced entry, except for the fact that a key was broken off in a door on the outside of the residence. Besides the missing items in the house, the radio had been stolen from her Jeep parked out in front of the home. Cell phone records revealed that a call was placed from Teresa's phone at 3.16 a.m. the next morning after she had already talked to a family member on January 24th. This call went to a residence in Gideon, Missouri, not far away. The person did not pick up the phone at the time of the call. In addition, there was another call made to Clarkton, Missouri, to a home where two women lived together. Neither the man nor these two women knew Teresa or anyone in her family. The women stated they heard nothing on the other end of the line when they answered the phone. Dale, Teresa's husband, states he and his wife had no marital issues before her disappearance, but Teresa told friends she received threatening phone calls from Dale's ex-wife. Dale dismisses those claims. The interview for this episode will be with Amy Lacey, a longtime friend of Teresa Butler, and the creator of the Teresa Butler website, along with the accompanying Facebook page. And now the housekeeping items. I remind you that you can follow the show on Twitter. It's at Unfound Podcast. You can email the show, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Please listen, share, and subscribe on Podomatic and iTunes. On Facebook, please join our little club, the Unfound Discussion Group. You can talk to me and other listeners. Like I said, it's a club where you can find out things about the show that aren't mentioned on each episode. I give you all a little bit of uh, behind the scenes of what's going on with the program. And please spread the word on sites like WebSleuths, Reddit, and any other true crime forums. And now, unfound news. We set a new download record last Friday for the episode concerning the disappearance of James Walker. The thanks goes to all of you. I cannot thank you enough. In other news, I'm working on an episode where I am going to give you a behind-the-scenes look 
at a case I was involved in when I lived in Las Vegas. The disappearance happened, and then shortly after that, I found out about it and got involved with some other people who were looking into it. And over the course of several months, I got to meet the parents of the person who disappeared. I took part in a search in the desert in Las Vegas. I got to meet a private detective who was working on the case. I'm going to give you the behind-the-scenes look at what that was all like, in addition to talking about the case and what I believe happened. I can only do that in one case, uh, but I'm going to try to do my best in explaining it to you. What's the case? That'll just be a mystery for now. And finally, I've picked out the place where I'm going to hold a meetup for amateur detectives. This meetup will be to study, investigate, research disappearances in the Tampa area, because that's where I currently live. The meetup's going to be held at the Madeira Beach Library. It's going to be once a month. I'm just not sure what day of the week and is going to be or the time, but it is happening. So if you live in the area, I'd love for you to come out and join the crowd. One note about this interview that I'm about to present to you. As I told you before the summary, there's several facts that are in dispute. In fact, there are opinions that differ between the police, the family, reporters, and rumors, and even the woman who I am interviewing for this episode to the point where, in some cases, they directly contradict each other. And that's why sometimes in this interview you're going to hear the three words, I don't know more than maybe in some of the other interviews because it's not that we don't know, it's that the facts are in dispute. And that's, once again, what makes this case so strange, just to use another word. You'll just have to fill in the blanks yourself, and I'll offer my thoughts as I do afterwards. I now give you my interview with Amy Lacey, best friend of Teresa Butler, and the administrator of both the Teresa Butler website and the Teresa Butler Facebook page. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound a very close friend of Teresa's, her friend, Amy Lacey. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Amy, tell the listeners a little bit about Teresa. What do they need to know about her? What was it like to be her friend? It was wonderful to be her friend because she was a friend to everybody. She loved everybody, and she was always so nice and gracious with everybody. Yeah. I never heard anyone say that they did not like her. Mm -hmm. And so she, she was kind of a very sociable, very personable person. Um, I know that she had, you had a nickname for her. People had a nickname for her, right? Yes. Yeah. And what was, what was the nickname? It was Bones. <laughs> And I gave it to her in the sixth grade. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Why is that? Because we thought we needed nicknames. We thought it would be cute. <laughs> oh, okay. And honestly, I can't even remember what my nickname was. Probably Curly or Red or Tanny or... But hers was Bones because she was just always so skinny. Mm-hmm. Um, and how tall was she? She was skinny and tall, right? Yes. She was five foot seven when she disappeared huh. and wow. weighed about 110 pounds. Oh my, yeah. But that was that was normal for her. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that was just that was her genetic makeup, and her body could metabolize food better than mine, I guess, because mm -hmm. she could eat like a horse and still stay skinny. Yeah. And what? How old were you two when you got to know each other? You said in elementary school. How old were you? Um, I would have been, uh, nine years old. Mm -hmm. We were in the fourth grade. The year was 1980. Wow. So I would have been nine. Okay. And I remember, you know, playing on the playground with our Barbies and, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. We just had a good time. We had a good friendship all through high school mm -hmm. and even after. Yeah. And how often did you two keep in touch 
after high school. Did you live close to each other, or were you separated? Or how was that? Um, we lived close to one another for probably the first five or six years. Mm-hmm. And then my husband and I moved away for about 12 years. Oh, okay. Or 15 years before we came back. Came back to Missouri. Um, she, you know, she did travel down to visit me once, and we would always come up to Missouri to visit family, and I would see her when I could. So mm-hmm. we didn't, you know, we didn't hardly ever go for longer than 12 months without talking to one another, mm-hmm. which that was also back before cell phones. Right. You know, you had to write letters or have a landline, which Teresa and I hardly ever had a landline, but, okay, you know. We always picked up where we left off when we got together. So you could, you two could be not talk for several months, and when you talk, start talking again, it's like that that period of time never happened. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Exactly. That's. I think that's the definition of a true friend. I agree with you. It's when you can do that. Yes, that's true. It is. What do you remember about? Uh, and I know when this happened, but you can tell the listeners. What do you remember about the last conversation that you had with her? Was this your normal conversation? Had you not talked to her like months before that? Before this last conversation, yeah. when was the last time you talked to her? Before the last conversation. Oh, it had been several months. Mm-hmm. Um, but the last conversation we had was around Thanksgiving. Before mm. she disappeared, so right? That would have been 2005. Okay. Um, and she was so excited because she had learned how to drive a stick shift. You know, their Jeep was a stick shift, and she knew I could drive one. Mm-hmm. So she had to call and brag that now she has huh. two. <laughs> that's you know, it's it's that's very unique. Uh, usually, people learn to do that. You know, when they learn to start driving, and if they don't learn then. They may not learn for a long time, and but I guess she did. Yes, she did. She loved driving that Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we're and, in. You know, we mm-hmm. we talked about her boys and her job, and you know, we hit on a couple other subjects that I'm sure we'll talk about on down right. in this interview. But right, you know, it was so funny though because she was just so excited about that Jeep. Mm-hmm. She had just gotten she had just gotten that Jeep like shortly before you talked to her. I don't know how long they had had it, but she had just learned to drive it. She was so excited. She thought she was the poo driving that Jeep. <laughs> that's that's funny. That's funny. In the conversations before, I mean, we we'll get to the, the last conversation, but in those conversations before that last one, had she ever, you know, spoke about anything? You know, that wasn't that great in her life, you know, or not, I'm not asking for any personal information or anything, but what was going on in her life otherwise? Did, you, did it seem like things were going well? It did seem to me like things were going well. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember seeing her when she was pregnant with, I can't remember if it was her first child or her second. Mm-hmm. You know, and she had had some swelling issues. So we we just talked about pregnancy and babies and, you know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was it. Okay. I don't, you know, I don't remember any discussions where she had mentioned any marital problems with Dale or anything like that. Okay. Now let's go to this last conversation because in that last conversation she had with you, though, uh, some things did pop up. Please tell the listeners about what what she told you. Um, she had told me that Dale's ex-wife, Crystal. Um, I won't put the last name. No, there, please. That's Crystal that's fine. Thank had, you. Had um, come to her house and brought a police officer with her. And, you know, we're there to intimidate her. That was Teresa's take on the situation. Wow. Um, She said that uh, she was sure this gentleman was a cop because Crystal was a dispatcher. Okay. Um, And I had advised Teresa to get 
a restraining order against this woman. Mm -hmm. And she said she couldn't do that because she didn't feel like it would do any good because of her connections with the police officers Mm -hmm. and law enforcement in the area. Okay. But I did, you know, I did advise her to do that. And I know she was bothered by the phone calls and what she felt was harassment and intimidation by that woman. Was that the first time she'd ever brought that up in the conversations that you had with her? Did it surprise you? It surprised me that she said the woman had come into her house. Okay. But I do recall her talking to me before about phone calls with, you know, the lady calling her at work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's also mentioned by other people in newspaper articles. Right. That this lady had called her at work and Teresa seemed upset afterwards. Um, hmm. Did, so, did, what did Teresa, why did uh, Ter- Teresa think uh, this, this woman was doing this? Um, because I don't know for certain that mm-hmm. Dale she never was still married when Teresa and Dale got together, but I suspect that might be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, because the divorce from this woman, I keep saying this woman, the divorce from Crystal Mm -hmm. was, I think it was 2000, it was final, and Gavin was four when Teresa disappeared, so that would have put him being born in 2002 Mm -hmm. or late 2001. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I think when they got together, if he wasn't still married, I don't think the divorce was final. Okay. And you think that that still, the the ex-wife was still bitter about that like six years later, five years later? Yeah, I I, I think some people can be very bitter. I'm just going to be honest. I've witnessed it in my family. Mm-hmm. You know, they can just hold on to that grudge and that bitterness and resentment and hate and it festers. What did, did, the, did, the, did Crystal ever express to Teresa? Once again, I know this, this is a conversation you had with Teresa years ago, but did, what was the ex-wife trying to get Teresa to do? Leave her husband? Or, I mean, was it just, I mean, it, what was the motive? Motivation for this? No idea? I have no idea. So, did Teresa seem worried about this? Obviously, this is a... We should make clear. Was the police officer from the district around Risco, Missouri, or was he from somewhere else? Teresa was under the impression that he was from a different county further south. Okay. So... You know, maybe an hour south of Risco. I said, I'm going by what Teresa told me. I know. I know that. So, you know, I did not witness this event, but she told me this, and then two months later, she's gone. Mm-hmm. So, yes, that did cross my mind right. when she disappeared. Yeah, we should also note, though, that uh, it's not unusual for people to be bitter about their divorces and there are people several people out there in marriages now who have problems with ex-husbands ex-wives and those people don't disappear you know that happens that's just uh the state of the world today um do you think that Teresa this bothered her do, do you think that she was fearful did she think something bad might happen because of this or did she just kind of say, well, that's just the way it is, and I'll be fine? I think, honestly, from knowing her all those years, I think she was worried about it. Okay. Or she wouldn't have talked to so many people about it. Okay. And remembering the conversation, if this was, 
uh, you know, a couple months before Teresa disappeared. Do you know how long before your conversation with Teresa that that incident happened? Was it like the week before or the month before? No, that I don't know. Um, I wish I did. Um, tell the people, now that we're going to maybe get into a little bit closer to the disappearance, tell the listeners a little bit about Risco, Missouri. What's it like? What would it be like to go there, or see it, or? Uh, well, Risco is probably about the size of one city block. <laughs> oh, very small. Very small. The population is between <coughs> three and four hundred right now. Three, four hundred, um, not thousand, but hundred. Hundred, yes. Wow, okay. I mean, they're so few, they're talking about consolidating the school system with the neighboring school. Okay. Um, there's one police officer in town. I'm not sure about a gas station. There might be one, and there's one bank that's open part-time. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> so it's not, it's not a tourist destination for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, any stoplights in that town at all? No. No stoplights no. in Risco, Missouri? No. Uh, does it have its own post office? Yes. Okay. So it's a very, very small town where virtually everybody knows everybody. Virtually. Yes. Uh, what's the nearest big city to Risco? Well, you need to define your idea of big city. <laughs> okay, population, let's say over 10,000. Um, that would be probably Sykeston, and it's about a half hour from Risco. Okay. And then about a half hour from Sykeston, there's Cape Girardeau. If somebody, like, in a, you know, the reason I'm asking is, like, a small town like that, People would probably recognize maybe if some stranger was hanging out in town or, or something like that. You know, this guy or this couple, whoever, this car, maybe not, yeah. you know, it's a little bit unusual. Once again, because it's such a small town and everybody knows everybody. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move to the night um, that Teresa disappeared. Uh, what can you tell the listeners about that? Um, her brother and sister-in-law uh, left her house, I think the report said about 9.05. Okay. And then later, her sister-in-law talked to her on the phone about, you know, just general female stuff and acne cream and, you know, just general conversation. Mm -hmm. And then that's the last time anyone spoke to her that we know of. And where was her husband? He was at work. Okay, and? Work in Arkansas, mm -hmm. in a steel mill outside of Flavel, Arkansas. Okay, and that's about an, how long? How far away? It's about hour and 15 minutes or hour and 20 minutes. Um, and they had two kids. Where were their children? Their children were in the bed when they were found next morning. And so, this was this um, pretty standard for them? Did Dale always work at night? Yes. He, he was always on the night shift. Okay. And, I do believe so. Okay. So, he's at work, she's at home with the children, but then he comes home the next morning like he always does, and what's he discover? She was gone. She was gone. He was gone. The babies were still in the bedroom, one in the bed and one on the little seedy thing at the foot of the bed, I think. And there was no Teresa. Were so the he her family. were the kids harmed in any way? No. None. And the door, the front door, he had to unlock the front door to get in. Okay, so it was locked. So, okay. Yes, it was locked. Um, but he called Teresa's mother first, and I guess they ended up rounding up family, and then Teresa's sister-in-law, <clears throat> that she had 
<coughs> talked to the night before is the one that called the police. Okay, they pl they called the police right away. They didn't wait for like 24 hours or anything like that. No, they called the police that morning. Right away. I'm not sure exactly when he noticed the game systems and stuff missing. I don't know if it was before they called the police or after he walked through it, you know, once the police got there. But mm. they did call the police that morning. Just to be clear, where were you living at the time when Teresa disappeared? Maybe we didn't point that out. Where were you living? Glen Allen, Mississippi, about five hours away. Okay. And do you remember uh, where you were? How do you? How did you find out that Teresa was missing? I found out by phone call from one of our relatives up in Missouri. The next day, or the day after, or no, it was it was that day after it had been reported on the news. And what did you think when you heard this? <clears throat> well, first, uh, I started crying. Yeah. Um, and then my mind started clicking, and I thought, honestly, I thought maybe the ex-wife had had something to do with it. And you know, whether she okay. did it or had someone do it, I first thought of her. Okay, was it because of that conversation you had with Teresa two months before? Yes. But that was your first knee-jerk reaction to it? Yeah. Yeah, you didn't know any facts or anything like that, but that was just your initial emotional reaction? Yeah. Okay, you didn't think that she, she ran off with another guy, you didn't think that somebody else could have done something to her, that's what popped into your mind first? Well, the idea of her running off and leaving those boys was absolutely not. Not possible. Ever. Okay. Never, never. Those kids were her life. Her family was her life. I've never seen a family as close as that one is. Okay. She never would have left them. So the police, uh, did they come right over? Do you know? Yes. So they didn't wait the 24 hours or anything. They came right over. What were the things yeah, that were missing? Was, they found uh, some things that were missing, some things that were unusual. Also missing from the home were Teresa's purse, her cell phone, a digital camera, a camcorder, a PlayStation and games, a Nintendo GameCube and games, and a large Maglite mag flashlight. Mm-hmm. And then... And what the about the Jeep? From the Jeep? The stereo? The stereo from the Jeep. Do you know, did it look like if the Jeep had been broken into, or did it look like somebody used a key to get into it? Um, I did talk to Teresa's sister about that. Mm -hmm. I usually just don't repeat here to say, but Teresa's sister said that as far as she knew, the Jeep was not broken into, the doors were left unlocked. Okay. Yeah, you because know, this is a low crime area, and mm -hmm. to be honest, a lot of people don't lock their cars. A lot of people around here still don't lock their doors. Wow. That is unusual. That is unusual. Very small town feel to it. So those things were missing, but no, uh, any signs of uh, violence or anything in the house? Any broken windows? No. Any broken glasses? Lamps pulled? And anything like that? Nothing. Nothing. It, it just looks like somebody walked in, took that stuff, took Teresa, left the kids there, took the radio out of the Jeep and left. Yes. Okay, so no signs of violence at all. Um, did they do a search around the area? Yes. And they did. They had airplanes. They had four-wheelers. Eventually, there was a horse team that came in and searched. They had cadaver dogs. You know, they mm -hmm. they've covered all of those bases, and they have found nothing. 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 And but Risco, it's a small town. But would you say that the house that Teresa and her husband and her children lived in is it fairly secluded? How how close is the nearest house to theirs? 
Oh, it's not very far. It, no? You know, there's just, I don't know, 40 or 50 feet between Teresa's house and another house, I think. And then there's some kind of business, maybe a welding business or something mm. on the other side of Teresa's house. Okay, and nobody, <laughs> nobody that night... Um, now we, this was a discussion that you and I had, we've just so the listeners know, I've talked to Amy a couple times, but in the second conversation, um, somebody allegedly might've heard something that night. Can you tell the listeners a bit, a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I had a long time family friend that lived in Risco mm -hmm. on the first street as you enter town, which is like, you know, not very far from Teresa's house. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to travel roadway, but there's a ditch and a field you should cross. Um, he said to me that a neighbor was out that night walking a dog, and he could have swore he heard a woman scream. Wow. And this house by roadway is only a half a mile anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's probably a quarter of a mile if you could take a straight path. So it's very close. So, I mean, quarter mile is not that far. Yeah. Okay. And on a crisp January Missouri night, sound could probably travel pretty far. Yeah, it probably could, especially mm. with Tracy. She had a big mouth. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's a little bit of a clue that, you know, did the guy was out walking his dog. Did you ever catch the time that he was out there? Um, my friend did not tell me that, but okay. I was thinking he, he alluded to the fact that it could have been around, you know, 10 or 10.30. Okay, so not real late. In fact, not long after Teresa had just gotten off the phone. Yes, and before, her husband said he tried to call her and got no answer. Okay, so that would fit. Because he said, yeah, he said he tried to call her from work. He called her about every night about 11 <coughs> to check on her and the boys, and she did not answer. And so, was that, you know, a, do you, I mean, I, I don't know how many times you've had a ch chance to talk to Dale but would you say that that's unusual that she didn't pick up this time? Did she usually pick up the other times? Well, according to everything he said to the newspaper people, I have not talked to Dale mm -hmm. very often. I've only really met him once besides the candlelight vigil we had. Mm -hmm. um, but according to what he has said in the newspaper articles, uh, he said sometimes he had a hard time dialing out of his workplace because of all the metal in the building. Oh, from so his... there may have been other times that he did not get through. Mm. Okay, because of a cell phone? Cell phone reception. Yes. Um, would you say that uh, just your personal opinion and what you just what you know about what happened, would you say that uh, – let's first talk – let's do this this way. Uh, what were Teresa's family? I'm not asking for any intimate details, but how did Teresa's family take this? They were devastated. Mm -hmm. They were devastated, and from the beginning, you know, they knew there was foul play because Teresa would not just leave her family and her children. Mm -hmm. Now, we should know that we should let the listeners know something. Teresa's family, I don't know if all of it, but like her parents, they don't live very far away from where she lived, right? No, they live about a mile or two down the same road Teresa lived on. Wow. And what about the other family members? Did they live close as well? Um, her one sister lived probably five miles away. Maybe mm. six miles away, outside of Risco, in the other direction. Okay. And then she had another sister living in a neighboring town. Um, and her little brother, Ricky, lived with her mom and dad. Okay. And so the... they're all pretty close right in there. So when this happened, they could all very quickly come together and try to figure out yes. what to do. Yes. Um, so the family, you know, 
took the, obviously took this very hard, but they were trying to find her. Would you say that Dale took this hard? Um, I don't know, honestly, mm-hmm. how Dale took it. I wasn't up here until mm-hmm. a few weeks after it happened. Yeah. Um, and I didn't get a chance to see him then. So, but as a candlelight, we did a candlelight vigil mm-hmm. around the time of Teresa's birthday, the first year she was missing. And, yeah, he, he took that really hard. Okay. So... I guess that's all I can elaborate on that one. I understand. Um, what did you hear now? I mean, you've lived back in the area now for how long? No. We moved back in December of 2006, so it was almost a year after Teresa disappeared. So you've been there for a while, over 10 years now. Just the general feeling of the townspeople, what do they say about the disappearance of Teresa? Before we get into the particulars about what happened afterwards, some other things, what is the general feeling in Risco? Um, they're all, you know, shocked and sad that it could happen in their community. Yeah. And, you know, I think we all kind of question, are they going to, find somebody for this Mm -hmm. are we going to get answers you know Mm -hmm. do do you remember back to that time without once again getting into any suspicions or theories do you think that the townspeople were under the impression that this was going to get solved pretty quickly or was did people think this was like a deeper mystery harder mystery I think um which I didn't talk to anybody, but my own personal opinion and mm-hmm. me five hours away, I honestly thought it would get solved pretty quickly, mm. especially when they did pull together the major case squad with state troopers and pretty sure the mm-hmm. FBI came in and, you know, I thought there would be something. Yeah. Uh, being that you do live in the area st- uh, now, um, does Teresa's disappearance come up often in conversations you have with people or is it, do you think it's still in people's minds or has it kind of, you know, faded away? What, what's your opinion on that? I think it has faded away from people that it did not personally affect. Hmm. You okay. Know. Okay. Let's move to, um, the little bit of the investigation. Dale said that he was at work. Uh, the police interviewed him. Have, has his alibi ever been able to be broken all this time at all? No. No. How about the ex-wife? Do you know if she's been questioned or anything? I have no idea about that. But I do know when I talked to a police officer a few weeks after Teresa disappeared, mm-hmm. I did tell him about that phone conversation. So they did get that information. Now, what they did with it, I don't know. Okay. What did Dale say about the relationship between Teresa and his ex-wife? He said that there was problems in the beginning, but that things were okay now. But I had talked to Teresa two months you know, before she disappeared, and it's obvious things were not okay. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about were they good or were they not. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Teresa would have been one to exaggerate the bad relationship she was having with the ex-wife, just to say? In going to school with her and growing up with her, mm-hmm. I never saw her exaggerate anything no. like that. No. She didn't embellish stories or, you know, nothing like that. Uh, has the ex-wife, uh, is, is she, is, are she and Dale still friendly? I don't know. No. Um, I'm, I'm sure they probably do get along because they share a child. Yeah. So I would hope they would get along because that's best for the child. 
Uh, there was uh, something out there that this might have had something to do with drugs. Have you ever, does that sound something that rings true to you? You know, and what you've known now that you live back there for all this time, does that something that rings true? Or do you believe that's just a rumor? Well, I, I had only met Dale once before, so I can't really speak for him. Mm-hmm. You know, but I never in my whole life saw Teresa ever use drugs or mention drugs or nothing. Nothing. But, yeah, I did hear rumor after she disappeared that Dale was on drugs. But according to the investigation, there was no drug paraphernalia or any signs of drug use in that house. Nowhere. And when I was a guest in the house, I never saw anything that made me suspicious that there was drug use. So I'm I'm leaning more toward that being a rumor. Okay. Now here was here's where this gets even a little more interesting. So we have the the husband who's at work who seemingly has a pretty strong alibi. You but you do have an ex wife who just a couple months before seems really still ticked off that Teresa is with Dale and she brings this policeman along, which is you know, I don't you know what to make of that. But Teresa's cell phone, tell the listeners a little bit about that. Well, the, the story on the cell phone is just kind of weird because according to Sheriff Stevens, there was one call made at 3.16 a.m. that morning from Teresa's phone, and it went to two elderly ladies in, a, you know, a neighboring town, mm-hmm. and they said that they did not, uh, they said hello, but nobody on the other end said anything. And they did not know the Butler or Buchanan family. Mm-hmm. According to what's been reported in the newspapers, um, the family has said, Teresa's sister-in-law has said that they called the number and a man answered. Hmm. And uh, he said he didn't hear his phone ring, but he saw he had missed from that number. So let's just cl- okay. Let's just clarify this for a second. So, it, was there one call made or was there two calls made? I, there's like a discrepancy there. Which which is it? I have no idea because I've heard both. You've heard both yeah, stories. It's only saying one call. Okay. But they're saying you know between his story and the family story, it sounds to me like there was two to different people. Okay. So. Because it could be construed one way is that the these old women answered the phone at three fifteen a.m. and then it could be later that the same number was called and somebody else picked up, you know, a guy picked up. Which technically it's two calls, I guess, but it's to the same number. But uh, yeah. th- there's all that could be what happened. Yeah, I don't know. Uh. There's, there's discrepancy in these newspaper articles about that phone call. Okay. I'll give anything to see that phone bill. Right. Honestly, but. Did the family get the phone bill, or did the police get the phone bill? Uh, how did that work I'm out? Sure Do you know? Police, I'm sure the police have the phone bill, um, but I think maybe the family has a copy of it, too. I'm not sure. I've seen it, if they have it, but... Okay, but the, the confusing part is these people who answered the phone never heard of Teresa Butler, never heard of her husband, never heard of the family. Yes. And the the call that was made, what's it's it was made to a local other city, wasn't it? How? Yes. And what city was that? Um, Do you remember? Clarkson. It was Clarkson. Okay. The old... The older older ladies that answered were from Clarkson, Missouri, and that's a town of about I don't know twelve or thirteen hundred people. But once again, no idea why her cell phone, Teresa's cell phone, was used to make those calls. And no, her, no, no. And I've wondered if maybe the people that took her 
or trying to call somebody and dialed the wrong number. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe they shouldn't have asked these people, did they know Teresa Butler or the Buchanan family or the Butler family? Maybe they should have asked these people if they knew any of these few suspects they might have had. And they may have. I don't know. Okay. Um, but the uh, Teresa's cell phone was never found. No. Never found. Um, that has been reported in the newspaper. Okay. Now, I will tell you, I've heard rumor that it has been found. And I've heard rumor that her camera has been found, but it has never, ever been reported in the newspaper. Okay. So I kind of doubt the okay. validity of it. Um, do, do we know where her cell phone was? Do you, do you know the tower that it pinged off of? Was it around her house? Was it somewhere else? Do we know no, that? that I don't know. Nobody knows and that. to be honest, um, maybe back then around here, they, there might have only been one tower because we are a very rural area. Right, right, sure. So, sure. You know, I, don't, I don't know. I did ask about the tower things, and uh, Brenda didn't know. Brenda is Teresa's sister. She didn't. Uh, know anything about the tower pain. Okay. Very good. Let's move on to the next mysterious thing. Uh, let's talk about the lock on the front door of Teresa's house. What can you tell? There's, once again, seems to be some discrepancies here between the rumors and the police and news reports. What what can we, you tell the listeners about the, the, the lock on the front door of Teresa's house? Okay, a lock was furnished to the police by a relative of Teresa's mm -hmm. that had the tip of a key or a piece of metal broke off in it. But after going over these newspaper articles today and reading that Dale had to unlock that front door to get in, I'm wondering where the lock came from. Maybe it was on the back door. Right. I don't know. But, but the family furnished the lock to the police officer. So there was a lock that was on the house that allegedly had a key broken off in it. Yes. Okay. And the thinking for a long time was what? Which door was it? I, at this point, I don't know which door. I, nobody's ever really said which door they thought it had come from, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I went, I went back over all of these articles and did see where Dale had to unlock the front door to get in that morning. So it couldn't have been the front door lock. So it must have been, did the house have a back door? Yes, I'm pretty sure there was a back door. Okay. Um, so maybe it was a back door lock and there's not really been any more information given. About the law. And this is important because it could be that somebody did that maybe while breaking into the house. Maybe that was a key that uh, Teresa was, maybe she was outside and tried to get back into the house and maybe she was attacked as she was putting her key into the back door. We just don't know. No. But we're not sure, though, that that could have happened weeks ago or it could have happened that night. Yes. All right, so that's uh, something. Do you know that if uh, Teresa and Dale ever had the locks changed on the house? Like, it was it was Teresa's house and he moved in. Do you know if she had the locks changed? Uh, no, I don't. Just wondering, uh, just to, I have it in my notes here. I'm just wondering if somebody tried to break in to that house weeks before and with a, with a key they thought was going to work. Didn't work, and then maybe they decided to come back that night. We'll, we'll leave that to a little bit later. At some point after Teresa disappeared, there was a letter that was sent to Dale's mother. What can you tell us about that? Um, July 30th, 2006, it was reported in a newspaper that his mother had received a letter. 
but he wanted to keep the contents confidential. Um, so there has never been no more information released about this letter. I don't know if he has turned it over to the police. You know, I don't know if it pertains to Teresa's case, but they were they were questioning, you know, interviewing him about Teresa's case when mm-hmm. this letter came up. So I'm assuming it was about her case. Also in this same interview, he confirmed that there was foreign DNA found. They swabbed him and her little brother Ricky um, for comparison. Because, which Teresa cut a lot of hair in there. She cut the boy's hair and, mm. you know. So we're not sure what kind of DNA they found. Was it blood, saliva, hair, what? And I don't, obviously it's not ever matched anyone that I can think of. This would have been inside the house. That was supposed to be there. This, was, yeah. this, this would have been inside the house somewhere that this was found. Yes. Okay, speaking of which, I mean, we didn't talk about that before we should have. I guess they did find some DNA in the house. Have you know anything about fingerprints? The I'm sure they dusted for fingerprints. Just nothing. They did, but um, I don't know. I read that in one of the articles, and I, I don't know if they found fingerprints that did not belong okay. to their relatives. Or, you know, someone that they knew had been in there that was supposed to be there. Okay. Uh, it could be that the DNA might could have been from the plumber, for all we know. Just have knowing. Yeah. It could have been, he could have been doing something and cut his hand and they found something. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's get, let's get to this. And we don't maybe want to get into... Uh, we talked about Dale... And we talked about him working that night. But there is a story out there that, and we're not going to say who it was, but is there something that might be punch a hole in Dale's alibi for that night? Do we want to talk about that? W- without mentioning a name. Well, I had heard, again, mm. this could very well rumor, right. and it probably well is, that his car their Impala was seen at home early that morning before he says he got home. Hmm. But, you know, I don't know. The police have corroborated his alibi, so mm-hmm. I don't know. And then I was also reading in another newspaper article a while ago talk of a black car there with Florida plates. And Dale said he didn't know anyone with a black car with Florida plates. They did have friends from Florida, but I don't guess these people had a black car. Mm -hmm. Is it possible maybe that night, are we sure that Dale actually drove to work? Could it have been that maybe he got a ride to work with somebody else? No, it he could have parked the car somewhere else besides home, but... Okay. Uh, but the belief is he usually drove to work himself. He usually, like, yeah. didn't carpool or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. And once again, for the record, for the listeners, to our knowledge, to Amy's knowledge, to my knowledge, to everything that, that we've read, Dale's alibi for that night has never, um, you know, been undermined. It's, 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 tr- it, it, it's, conti- solid. it's solid. Thank you. Amy, what's this been like for you? Losing a friend like this, you know, it's been, uh, you know, over 11 years now. We just passed up, you know, the 11th anniversary of her disappearing. What's it, what's it been like for you? Torture. Torture because mm-hmm. you don't know, you never know. And you're always looking. Mm-hmm. Looking, you look down every gravel road, if there's trees, you look and you think, is she over there? Is she in that ditch? Where is she at? It's hard. Let me see, I'll take a second here. Let me take a second here. You know, it's been hard for you. And it's also been hard for you because over the years, 
I mean, there's people that have generated a lot of rumors about this as having been true, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we don't have to go into any names, but you've had people who were close to Teresa who have uh, fed you misinformation and lies and things like that as well. Yes, and there's been people that, you know, I thought would not ever do that because they had they had a reputable reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to find out I had been lied to or manipulated just to, you know, be so outspoken and try to make people look bad. Do you, do you think that's what it was? I mean, can you? I mean, do you, do you even have time to sit down and and think about why that what that motivation is? Because you have a, a woman who seemingly had no enemies in the world disappeared, beautiful kids, uh, a marriage. As far as we can tell, it's solid. I don't think there's any rumors that Dale was cheating on Teresa or anything. And still, there are people out there who wanted to lie to you. I mean, why is that? I have no idea. I think they were trying to convince themselves, maybe, of who, who, who done it, mm-hmm. or who they wanted it to be, or whatever. And you know, I guess because I am so outspoken, you know, mm-hmm. I ran with it, and I did post some information that I found out later to be false. So I had to backpedal and you know, apologize and eat crow, uh, to be honest, and it was awful. How long ago was this? Oh, golly, that was back in 2006. Okay, so... That was the same year she disappeared. Yeah, so this was early on that people were spinning rumors and telling lies and everything. Have you experienced anything like that since? Um... Well, the rumor sent in for sure, but not from the same people, mm. you know, um, which the one person that was the biggest food feeder of my crow pie, yeah. I don't talk to anymore. So. Right. I, I, but, well, I can understand that. But, you know, there, there's been people that I have talk to about Teresa and then they're like oh well I heard this and I heard this and I heard this and I just want to say please shut up you're Mm. repeating rumor you heard and you're repeating it as fact and you have no evidence please shut up Mm -hmm. is there any possibility that maybe somebody you know just could have that this is some sort of uh, just random burglary you know somebody thought you know some you know somebody wasn't home and do you do you i'm not going to ask you i just want to say for the record for the listeners i'm not going to ask amy what she thinks ha- thinks happened because this is a very unique situation uh we have here in her talking to me because she's not a member of the family and she's not a reporter or anything she's just a very very close friend of the person who disappeared but is it possible that is that somebody just strolled in from out of town and did this or do you th- is the popular rumors it's a little closer to risco than just some stranger made amy disappear or teresa disappear i think it's a little closer to home is that right okay yeah i will okay the, they have all said since the beginning there was no sign of forced entry Okay. And I just don't see a five foot seven, one hundred and ten pound woman opening a door in the dark to strangers mm-hmm. stealing from her vehicle or trying to get into her house with her two boys there. Yeah. And there were no guns in the house. You know, there was no real way to protect herself. I just don't see her opening that door to strangers. Yeah. We, you and I had talked about, you know, we had played out a different, a couple different scenarios of what might have happened. And there was the possibility we talked about that 
Maybe she heard somebody breaking into her Jeep or getting into her Jeep if the doors were unlocked. She gets the fat flashlight, which of course we now know is gone. She takes the flashlight, walks outside to see what's going on, and that's what happened. But you, you don't buy into that, do you? No. Why not? Because I just don't see her risking her boy's life. You know, mm-hmm. if she had no clue who was out there, I don't see her risking her boy's life. Now, if she had known the person and thought she could step outside and talk some sense into him, mm-hmm. that would be different. But if that was a stranger, I don't think she ever would have opened the door. Right. You know, uh, Amy, I agree. I could be wrong. Yeah. But. Yeah. Uh, the listeners. I know if it were me, and I'm rough and tough and don't take no crap, <laughs> if there was a stranger outside and it was just me and my grandbabies here, I would not dare open that door right. and try to stop them from stealing whatever they want. I would just say, take it off. Just leave my grandbabies alone. Right. You, uh, the listeners should know that I did try to get somebody from Teresa's family uh, on this episode and was unable to do so. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you do talk to the family. You know, and, and how how have they handled this over the years? It's been really hard on her mom and dad. Yeah. You know, they have both suffered health setbacks, and I think a lot of it is from this stress and the worry. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's just been really hard. Yeah. Um, I don't, you just you handle it the only way you can. you got to do what you can to get on with your day-to-day routine. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to ask you what they think. Uh, but they do have they have their own theory about what happened, don't they? They do not believe that she is still alive. Okay. And I know we're all supposed to have hope. Right. You know, but sometimes the only way a person in this situation can deal with it, especially when they know their loved one would not voluntarily leave, mm-hmm. is to, you know, I, I hate to you know, so accept the fact that they're gone, but just, you know, be realistic about it. Yeah. And say, you know, more than likely, my loved one is dead. And, you know, they have said so in the newspapers and all of that stuff. They just, you know, they want some closure. They need it. Her boys need it. You know, I don't want them growing up thinking, well, maybe mommy could have just run off and left them because that is so not the case. Yeah. What motivated you uh, to start the website and to start the Facebook page? When did you do that? What made, motivated you to do that? Um, I started the website in 2006, I think a few months after Teresa disappeared. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that because, you know, I didn't see any other websites for her. And I just wanted her her name and her face out there. I don't want people to forget that she was a person. She is a person. She was a mother. She was a daughter, a sister, a friend, mm-hmm. a wife. You know, and if her face ain't out there, then people can forget. That's true. Um, and all, over the years, you know, it, this may sound weird for me to say, but over the years, I've never forgotten her face. But I forgot what her voice sounded like. Hmm. Yeah. So... You know, I know her boys. They were young, and they they don't remember, especially the little one. Gavin might have a few memories, but the little one, I'm sure, don't. He was only two. But I just hope that they know that their mother was special. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the website? When did you start that? 
The, the I mean the uh, Facebook page. The Facebook page. So I started the Facebook page. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe 2008 or 2009. Okay. Um, but. Mm-hmm. You, she must have really been a close friend for you to do that. I mean, because obviously none of her other friends that she had for a long time did that. You chose to do that. You two must have been very close. We were. She was the maid of honor at my wedding. She was mm. the godmother to my oldest child. Um, mm. And we always picked up where we left off. Yeah. And... She was the exact opposite of me because I'm abrasive and rough and <laughs> can be downright rude. And she was the exact opposite. So we complimented one another. Yeah, well, I, I don't find you abrasive or rude at all, Amy. I've enjoyed uh, talking to you, you know, the times we've talked. And, you know, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying this interview, too. Um, tell uh, the listeners uh, the, the address of the website. So they can go there and also tell them what the name of the Facebook page is so uh, we can get that included in this episode. You can find the website at um, find-teresa-butler.tripod.com. Okay. And I have been unable to edit this website since a long before I ever made her Facebook page it's just not letting me edit it okay I don't know why. okay um, and the Facebook the Facebook page you can find at help find Teresa Butler missing from Risco Missouri okay great anything else uh, that we we should mention in this episode about Teresa you know who was one of your closest friends? Eleven years is too long to not know anything. That's just—I mean—that's just all I can say. I love her. I miss her mm -hmm. so much. I want to tell her. Okay, Amy. Thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. And that was my interview with Amy Lacey, best friend of Teresa Butler. Amy, of course, also manages the Teresa Butler website and the Facebook page, and I will be linking to those places, those sites on the Internet, when I post this program. You should know, and I need to apologize, you probably noticed my breathing during that episode, that it was a little louder than it usually is. I actually had an asthma attack occur during the interview felt something coming on before we started, and I didn't know it was going to get as bad as it did. And in fact, by the end of the interview, I was having difficulty breathing, and that continued through Tuesday, which uh, was the day that the interview was conducted. It continued through Tuesday, and I didn't get to a doctor until Wednesday morning. I feel great now. I got enough medicine that I think that uh, asthma and an elephant could be cured. But in listening to the tape, the recording of the interview afterwards, I can hear myself wheezing, and I, I apologize. I didn't know that it was going to be that ob obvious, and I thought all of you needed an explanation. I'm fine now. It's just this time of the year here in the Tampa area. In fact, all across Florida right now, southern Florida, mid-Florida to southern Florida, pollen is flying around, and my body hates pollen. A actually, Tampa and Orlando area are two of the worst places in the United States right now for pollen allergies. And sometimes I get through it, sometimes I don't. I didn't get through this season very well. In fact, that asthma attack uh, that I had on Tuesday was one of the worst ever. I was actually sore the next day. My chest and my shoulders were sore by my body trying to open my lungs up more. So I apologize I don't think it's going to happen again because I'm going to stick to the medicine, and I hope uh, you'll understand uh, me in this matter. Uh, I know that audio is always a big deal regarding podcasts, and I want to make it uh, as good as I can. I just didn't know that I was going to have an asthma attack during this interview, so I apologize. As for the interview, you got to hear how emotional Amy still is all of these years later a couple times during the interview we had to take a moment to stop 
while she collected herself. And then, of course, right there at the end of the interview, you could tell that this is still very raw, very emotional. It's like it happened yesterday. And I think that's going to be the way it'll be for her and for Teresa's family until this case is solved. Amy afterwards wanted me to add something to the interview is that it should be known after that first year that Teresa disappeared, there have been hardly any leads. So 10 years of very, very few leads. Regarding those three words that I mentioned before the interview, the words, I don't know, now you see why I said that. We're not sure about the cell phone calls. Was it one call? Was it two calls? Were they both answered? Were they both not answered? You talk to the police, they say one thing. You talk to the family, they say something else. You read news reports from back the time. Some may agree with the police. Some may agree with the family. And then there's all the rumors out there. How do you get to the bottom of all that? I don't know. I think that if I had all the reporters in one room and the family and the police we might be able to come to a conclusion. We might be finally able to talk this all out. But of course, that would probably be next to impossible. So a lot of it remains up in the air. You're going to have to make your best judgment, what you think you know about disappearance cases, on who you wanted to believe, want to believe, or what makes the most sense. The cell phone calls, the broken key in the lock, was it a front door, was it a back door? Dale says he used a key in the front door when he got home, so that would mean the back door had the broken key in it. But I can tell you for a long time when I first got to know this case last year, I thought it was the front door. I don't know. In addition, was Dale's car seen there that morning? Wasn't it seen? It's just hard to determine. Now let's take a look at some of these people involved. It certainly does sound like the ex-wife had a lot of malice toward Teresa. Teresa does not sound like a liar to me, and I do believe that that was the truth that Teresa was telling her friend Amy in November of 2005 about the ex-wife showing up with a policeman, which in and of itself bothers me a lot. I don't like how policemen keep popping up in these cases. The ex-wife is certainly a viable option a viable suspect in the disappearance of Teresa. But I have to tell you, I have my doubts. And I will talk about those doubts at the end of this list. Dale, her husband. Some places you're going to see that his name is mentioned as Gary, but people who are close to the case who knew him call him Dale. Let's keep in mind that his alibi has never been broken in 11 years works an hour and a half away if he wanted to do something to his wife. He went to work. Somehow he slipped out, drove an hour and a half home, broke into the Jeep, stole those things, did something to Teresa, then made it back to work another hour and 15 minutes the opposite direction. It just doesn't seem possible. Somebody surely would have seen him, and somebody would have noted that he was gone. If he only lived 10 minutes away, then I guess that's something different. An hour and 15 minutes in a different state. I got to tell you, I know that there have been a lot of uh, problems with police and police letting the things slip through the cracks. It's hard to believe that they would let uh, an alibi like that fall through the cracks. It's just hard for me to believe. And in addition, it's hard to understand the motive. It doesn't sound like he had some woman on the side. To my knowledge, uh, he's not been married since. He might have had another child since, but it's been 11 years. It's going to happen. It's not like he popped up with another woman uh, a month later, as does happen in some disappearance and murder cases. It certainly makes an ex-wife or an ex-husband look very guilty. It's just hard to understand the motive. In addition, it's hard to understand if he might have hired somebody to harm his wife because how would he pay him off? What, with a radio from a Jeep? With some video games? Was he socking money away? They were not a rich family. 
That's a little hard to understand, too, on top of the fact that I believe it was more than one person who committed this disappearance. Has to be more than one. Given everything that was taken, it has to be more than one person. At least two, if not more. Dale's really going to hire two or three people to make his wife disappear? I just, I just don't see that either. Was this just some random occurrence? Just a couple guys, maybe some meth addicts, maybe some crackheads, I don't know, just cruising around on the back road. They just happen upon this house where a woman just happens to be alone at home with her children. It just happens to be that the man of the house isn't there. Once again, it's this isn't the suburbs. This isn't a dangerous part of the United States where people are just cruising around looking to commit crimes. Once again, in my mind, that's a little hard to imagine that just some couple guys randomly pull up and do something and break into the house or Teresa comes out that they go into the house, steal those video games and the rest of the stuff and they don't do something with the kids too. What are these kidnappers with a heart? That's hard to imagine. I think they'd take the kids too. As, as sad as that would be, uh, in addition to the case already being sad, just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If these guys are that evil, then it seems to me they'd take the kids too. I have to tell you that when I look at this case, and I've been living with this case for a while, this case feels very personal to me. And I agree with the family that I believe that they say that it started with a break-in of the Jeep. I believe that. I think looking at it, it's just hard for me to imagine that they went into the house first and then on the way out they said, oh yeah, let's break into the Jeep, let's get the radio out of the Jeep. Two, granted, the Jeep might have been unlocked, but you're almost to the car. How long does it take to steal a radio out of a Jeep? Five, ten minutes? Surely longer than it takes to pick up a video game system and run out the house. So... I agree that it started outside. And who would break into a Jeep or go into a Jeep for a radio? Sounds like somebody who really needs a couple bucks really bad. I mean, really, who steals radios these days? Then one thing led to another, and they took the things that could easily be pawned. Teresa hears something going on, and I believe, I'm going to state this for the record, I think Teresa knew who took her. There's not much uh, doubt in my mind. Because definitely there was one more, more than one person who did this. And what kind of hitman or drug user or whatever, whoever, works in a group? In addition, I once again go back to the fact that the kids were left there. She was taken. If this was a planned thing... Say the ex-wife hired somebody or the husband hired somebody. Would they really hire more than one person? Does it really take more than one person to take care of a little housewife in Risco, Missouri? I think not. Instead, I think it was a group of guys, two or more, who showed up that house to rip off the radio. And Teresa looked out the window, knew who was out there, and maybe had a flashlight and went out to see what the heck they were doing. And one thing led to another. And it could be that the reason that the kids weren't harmed is because the only reason they were harming Teresa is because she saw them. Not necessarily because they saw her as an enemy. I do not believe that the people who showed up at Teresa's house that night were there to harm her necessarily. I think that she got in the way of a plan that they had. And because she knew who these people were, they needed to take her with them. To me, in my mind, that's the only thing that makes sense. Uh, I should note for the record, 
uh, that I'm not sure that Dale had any life insurance on his wife, Teresa. I'm guessing that he did. But you should know that Dale did not live the high life from Teresa's disappearance. In fact, I don't think that that's ever been mentioned at all in any of the discussions I've read anywhere that he might have had her disappeared for the insurance money. I've never read that anywhere. And that, once again, leads me to believe that he didn't have anything to do with it. I don't think, despite the ex-wife and her anger toward Teresa, I'm not sure she had anything to do with it. It feels very personal to the point that I think that Teresa knew who was out in her yard that night, and that's why she went outside. Because I do not not believe they broke in. In fact, there was no signs of a break-in at the house. But I leave it up to you. You can talk about it at the Facebook group, our Unfound Discussion group. You can email me about it and tell me what you think. You can talk about it on WebSluice or Reddit. You'll see me posting there as well. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.